We'd love to hear what you think about Litigation Radio. Please go to LegalTalkNetwork.com slash litigation to fill out a quick survey to give us some feedback on the show. As a fellow litigator, I know you have strong opinions, so let us know what topics and guests are most important to you. Thanks so much for your help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Litigation Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scriven Young. I'm a commercial and environmental litigator in the Chicago office of Picard and Abramson, which is recognized as the largest law firm serving the construction industry with 150 lawyers and 11 offices around the U.S. On this show, we talk to the country's top litigators and judges to discover best practices in developing our careers, winning cases, getting more clients, and building a sustainable practice. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting app to make sure you're getting updated with future episodes. This podcast is brought to you by the litigation section of the American Bar Association. It's where I make my home in the ABA. The litigation section provides litigators of all practice areas the resources we need to be successful advocates for our clients. Learn more at ambar.org slash litigation. For law firms, effective client retention can be the difference between flourishing and failure. For litigators, the problem is exacerbated because cases can be one-off matters that don't naturally keep you in front of clients. So how do litigators maintain relationships with in-house counsel and help our law firms keep clients for the long term? Well, to answer these questions and more, we've invited on today's show leaders and litigators who are involved in organizing the litigation section's upcoming Corporate Counsel CLE seminar to give us some practical and realistic advice. Naomi Berry is a shareholder at Carlton Fields in their Miami office, where she represents lenders and servicers in consumer finance and banking litigation matters. She has represented national banking and financial institutions in numerous residential and commercial foreclosure matters and defended against lender liability and loan servicing claims in both individual and punitive class actions. Naomi has a particular passion for advancing women in the business community and has served in many leadership roles, including as president of the Women's Chamber of Commerce of Miami-Dade County, as well as being co-chair of the ABA Litigation Section's Corporate Counsel Committee. Naomi, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Nicole Galley is managing member of ND Galley Law LLC in Philadelphia. She focuses her practice on commercial litigation, including all forms of intellectual property litigation and IP counseling, especially regarding trade secret protection. After spending over two decades at larger law firms, Nicole founded her own firm in 2015 to provide clients with sophisticated, first-in-class legal services in an efficient manner that best suits their business needs. Nicole also has served in various leadership positions, including her stint this year as co-chair of the Corporate Council Conference. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. Well, I know that both of you have compiled about six tips to share with our audience, but before doing that, I know that both of you are involved in the planning of the ABA Litigation Section's Corporate Counsel CLE Seminar, which is being held in Orlando February 16th through the 18th. So I've never been to the conference before, but I've heard great things and would like to go this year. So Naomi, can you give us a preview of what first-timers might expect going to the conference? Sure, Dave, I'd be happy to. This has always been one of my favorite conferences. That's part of why I was interested in working on the committee. It's a, it tends to be a smaller, more intimate conference, and we have a higher volume of in-house counsel at the conference. So it's a great way to get in front of your clients and prospective clients. We have programming that's geared specifically to appeal to in-house clients who are, are managing litigation. So In terms of how the conference goes, the first day we start off with two panels of in-house counsel. We have our litigation management roundtable, which I'll be helping to moderate. And we also have typically our general counsel forum. And the first night we have our dine arounds, which are a really fun way to get to know people. You go to dinner in in smaller groups, either at the hotel or nearby. And I have to tell you, the conference this year is at the Ritz-Carlton in Orlando, and we were there last year as well. It is a beautiful hotel, lots of great amenities and a great place to bring the family. And then Friday, we have lots of programs in the morning. We have our pro bono awards lunch. Um, some free time in the afternoon. And Saturday, we have more programs and then the golf tournament as well, which is always very popular. Um, and and Friday night, we have a, a big dinner with some live entertainment. So it's a great way to connect with your friends from the section of litigation and to connect with in-house counsel. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about the the themes that we have for this year's conference. So 
Before you get there, though, I have to ask you about the golf tournament because I am a very poor golfer, but I would love, I know that golfing is something that a lot of people do to network and would love to get into a foursome with, you know, someone from in-house counsel. Do you have to be a good golfer to be a part of the golf tournament? I don't believe so, Dave. I am also not a golfer. I will not be in the golf tournament, but I think anyone who's willing to try can, can participate and make a fool of themselves if they want to, um, just do your best. (laughs) Okay. That sounds great. All right. Uh, you wanted to talk about the themes of the conference, please. Yes. So we, we have a lot of different interesting and and topical programs, but we have several that fit into a, a couple of themes that I think are really relevant right now. And I'll talk about, we have a few that I would put into the basket of current events. One of those programs is called crisis management, how to prepare for the next normal And we also have Navigating Turbulent Waters, Effective Strategies for Advising Corporate Clients in Politically Sensitive Times. You know, there's been a lot of interesting stuff going on in the news in the past couple of years. You know, we saw a lot of issues, for example, with companies wanting to know, you know, can we come up with a policy to pay for employees that need to go out of state for abortion care, things like that, Um, really hot topics for in-house counsel and outside counsel. Uh, I think these will be really interesting programs. We also have during our Friday luncheon, Ken Berman is going to give his version of a TED Talk called The Supreme Court's Undoing Project and the Urgency of Corporate Social Responsibility. That should be really great. And we also have a fireside chat with Kenneth Polite, who is the assistant attorney general of the criminal division. So we're really looking forward to that program as well. Well, Naomi, that sounds uh, really interesting. And Nicole, were there any other uh, themes that you wanted to bring to our attention regarding the conference? Absolutely. One of the things in planning the conference that we tried to do was make sure that we had a couple of what I would call hot topics besides just current events. And by that, I mean hot topics in the law. This year, we really were centering around uh, protecting key assets and information in a company. So that would be things like cybersecurity, data privacy, trade secrets, but also blockchain. So we have Cyber Jeopardy, navigating a data breach from start to finish. There's also a program on emerging legal issues in the world of blockchain assets. And one of our very last programs, which I will be handling, uh, moderating with a group of folks, and that's going to be one of the last programs on Saturday, right before the golf tournament. So I hope folks will stick around. That's going to be around best practices for trying a trade secret case, because a lot of more jury trials are happening in the trade secret world, especially now that you know jury trials are resuming generally with COVID. So we have a, a great lineup for that. Well, that sounds outstanding. So um, let's get away from talking about the conference. Let's delve into our tips for uh, maintaining relationships with in-house counsel. Nicole, do you want to start us off? So Naomi and I collected some tips from some of our panelists on the litigation management roundtable. So you'll hear more about these during that program and also from our committee and our own experiences. And and I'd say the top tip that we heard, and it's really throughout a lot of the tips overall, um, was the idea of communication. And in fact, a couple people specifically said, communicate, communicate, communicate. And within that, probably the top thing people said was, in-house counsel told us, was that tell them the bad news right away. Tell the client if you think a lawsuit is a loser or just a bad idea for some reason. Really what they want to know is they want to know ahead of time if it's going to be a waste of money, then going through it and finding out that it's a mistake after. But that could also, there are other forms of bad news too. So for instance, if you know a lead attorney or a key member of the team becomes unavailable or there's a problem with deadlines or timing, again, tell them that right away. Don't hide it because it's, or try to sort of gloss over it because they really need, you know, while it may be frustrating and upsetting to, that there are delays or certain people are unavailable, they need to know and need to know it right away. The other aspect of communication that we heard was making sure you understand the cadence, how often they want to hear from you. You know, is it once a week? Do they want real time updates? Do they want to have regular meetings? And in one for- what format? You know, should it be a live meeting, a Zoom, by email? 
So communication was one of the most important things that we heard. We can understand that if any of us have ever had the experience of being clients, which uh, you know I've had a couple of times myself for various reasons. I can tell you as a client, communication is absolutely important. And believe it or not, not all lawyers communicate with their clients. You talked about format, Nicole, and I think it's really important to understand. You know, it's it's really easy to send an email, uh, to send a text message, kind of updating, you know, the clients. And I think, you know, back in the day, you know, letters were kind of the thing. You would send send your letter out, your update letter to the client. But I think for more particularly for bad news, but certainly for kind of those real-time updates. I think a phone call always works, I think, best, you know, for clients where, you know, they, they don't want to get bad news, you know, in an email if it's something, especially if it's something catastrophic or an, or an emergency happens. They want to hear about it right away. And certainly if if it's bad news, they, they want to hear about it, you know, in person rather than just kind of an email being sent out, although that is that is a lot easier than than doing it the other way for sure. Yeah, I think the key was that we heard was definitely, you know, confer with the client. I think I I remember one of them mentioning something like, even if it's just to say, I can't talk about talk right now, but, you know, can I get five minutes of your time later or got your email, can't respond, be back as touch as soon as I can. So to your point, I do think that if you're going to be delivering bad news, that's better done in some live format. But you know, certainly don't, I I would say don't delay (laughs) just because you can't do that, right? If it's a time sensitive kind of thing. That makes sense. All right. So let's go on to tip number two, Naomi. Sure. So our second tip is to understand what the client wants to review and be involved with. You know, this can really vary a lot depending on the in-house counsel that you're dealing with. You know, I know I've had experiences where some people want to review every draft, no matter how significant, Other people only want to see, you know, a a dispositive or very significant motion or or be involved with big picture strategy. Similarly, find out what the client will authorize you to do on your own. Do they want to be consulted for every extension of time or scheduling of a deposition? Or are you authorized to go ahead and, and make those agreements on your own? And remember that this will also affect your internal deadline. So it's important for you to know can I finish this draft on the day that it's due? Or is this something that the client is is going to want to review? And that's something that really your whole team needs to be aware of as you plan out what you're working on in the case. Similarly, I was very surprised by this tip. So obviously this is happening. So I want to make sure I share it. If in-house counsel edits a brief, implement their changes or discuss with them why you're not doing it. And again, I would have thought everyone is doing that. Of course, you're implementing the client's changes or explaining to them why you disagree. But we heard this from one of our committee members. So obviously, this is something she's encountered more than once. Um, Certainly take their changes to heart. Wow. Yeah, that 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 is really surprising that somebody wouldn't accept a client's changes or at least say, hey, we, we can't do that for X and Y reason. Um, that's fascinating. So b- back to the first tip, though, how do you implement that tip? Is it something where you would recommend something that would go into the engagement letter? Or is it more during the initial meeting when you're meeting with the client, you're just asking them, you know, what do you want to see? How much authority am I going to have and that sort of thing? You know, my practice has been typically that's something that you discuss when you have a new client or a a new person that you're working with at the client. Maybe the client has a new member of the team. Um, When a new matter comes in, what kind of of drafts do you want to see? Or potentially with the first thing you draft, go ahead and send it to them and say, you know, by the way, we're filing this motion. Is this the kind of thing that you would like to see? You know, let me know what your preferences are. That's not something I typically would have in an engagement letter, but I think it's a good conversation to have up front. And then as you bring people into your team or have a a subsequent matter with perhaps an associate that didn't work with them before, make sure that everyone on the team is aware of, of what the expectations are so they can plan accordingly. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. All right, Nicole, we're ready for your second tip. Yeah, absolutely. So I I think this dovetails really nicely with the last theme or last tip, which is you really need to be, one thing, and this was some in-house counsel who shared this with us, is you really need to think of in-house counsel as part of the litigation team. And you also need to understand their particular role, both in terms of the case, but also within their company, the value that they bring, and 
the fact that they need to consider the bigger picture beyond a specific case. One of the things I, I think oftentimes you need to understand, and I like to understand when I'm working with a new client, is what level of authority they have internally and who they have to report to, but also really make sure that you are recognizing that they have valuable input. That that actually kind of goes back to the, where Naomi ended with her last tip in terms of the edits that they're making. Many times I know I'm dealing with ex- very experienced litigators, folks who you know sat in my shoes for many years and have a lot to contribute. Also, they have a broader perspective on how the litigation fits in with the rest of, you know, what's going on within the company. And so there are important things that you as an outside attorney may not know and really do need to take into account, you know, in how you're managing the case or even in how a particular part or of a brief or an argument is being presented because it could have implications beyond your particular case. So making sure that you're being a team player with your client and seeing them as part of the team as opposed to, you know, maybe somebody separately removed is important. But I would also add, you know, it also depends on your client, right? Some people may want to be more hands off. So you just have to really kind of get a feel for the particular client that you're working with. Well, that's a great tip. And I think, you know, you need to build in into your timeline if you're drafting a brief or whatever, getting getting ready for an argument to get the input of the folks that you need at the client in advance you know, well before the brief is or brief is due or the argument is going to be made um, to get that input in there. So if you if you know that there's two two or three steps that the client's going to have to go through to provide input on a brief, then you need to build in that time uh, to get the client the brief well in advance so they can review it and provide those comments and then you can implement those comments. That's really key because there's no you can't get that valuable input if you're giving it to them, you know, the night before it's due for sure. That fits in really well with my next tip, which is to understand the client's time constraints and requirements. Something we heard from several people was never send drafts at the last minute, especially if they're lengthy. You know, that that's a real pet peeve. Uh, you should also try to communicate early about upcoming deadlines you know, don't be afraid to ask the client about their schedules. You know, for example, re- I had a, a response to a, a summary judgment motion that was due around the end of December. And I proactively reached out to my in-house contact and said, you know, we have this deadline. I'm going to be working, but what, what does it look like for your team? Should we go ahead and ask for an extension? Will people be around? And we ended up deciding to get that extension to take the pressure off and to be sensitive to everyone's schedule. And uh, it ended up being very helpful because even though in-house counsel was working, we had some questions for some of the business people who weren't around. So we were glad that we gave ourselves some extra time. They also said, We should be sympathetic to the time pressures on in-house counsel and the business people that they're working with. You know, we as litigators, we litigate all day, every day. We're used to the pace of litigation, but litigation is very disruptive to business people and outside counsel need to be realistic about the time that those business people will need to devote to the litigation, be realistic about what we're asking them for. And to the extent that we can talk about that with them up front so that they can plan accordingly to make sure that they can do the other aspects of their job. It's really important to communicate about the time that that you expect you'll need from them. Well, and that's really key for something like a summary judgment motion where you might need affidavits from, you know, maybe several members of, of the client's team to get facts that you're either trying to put as an affirmative summary judgment motion or defending against one. And if your client is unavailable during the time that you need to get that affidavit, then yeah, being very proactive and asking for an extension or taking some alternative approach seems really key in that situation. Absolutely. So um, Nicole, let's, uh, let's move on to your third tip. 
And this is a little bit of a shift from our earlier tips, which really focused on, you know, the relationship overall between you and and the in-house counsel. But this does fall into another category, like Naomi had said earlier with one of her tips of things I was surprised that people have to say. And we got this from one of our in-house attorneys who's going to be on the litigation management roundtable in particular, but which was provide in-house counsel with the right outside counsel team for the specific case. That seemed obvious to me, but but I, you know, I I spent it long enough in big law to understand that in a larger law firm in particular, you know, that that folks may want to just do kind of whatever their client needs. But, you know, the message I think really there is if you're the right person, great. But if we really need to get somebody else in the firm involved, or even honestly, and this is something I see in a smaller firm, I don't do things outside my lane, right? If there's something where I feel like I really need to get a different legal professional involved. I have a a network just like I would when I was in a law firm, except they're not part of my firm that I go to. And my clients are very appreciative when I'm giving them the right people, you know, even if that person isn't in my firm. So, you know, I know this is extremely important to clients. I just think it's amazing that Clients have to say it, but, you know, you can't be all things to all people, I guess, is is what the old adage says. Related to that, the very same person also pointed out, and this meant a lot to me as a woman-owned firm in particular, consider the importance of team diversity. And again, you know, I wish that was one of those things that we didn't have to say that was assumed, but unfortunately, I don't think that's true. So, but it was great to hear that. It was great to hear that that's important to in-house attorneys. And I think that if folks, you know, who are listening haven't gotten that message, I'm glad they're hearing it again because that is also part of having the right outside counsel team. There's, you know, legions of studies that show having a diverse team is not only the right thing to do, but also leads to better results. And, you know, so I think it's really important that we keep that in mind as well when we're staffing cases. And did any of the folks that you talked to talk about uh, the use of associates in terms of how associates are, are, I mean, basically when associates are on cases, they're, they're training on how to be a lawyer. They're training on how to be a litigator in that specific practice area. Um, Did any, did any, any of your contacts talk about the use of associates or, or how, how does your firm kind of use associates and, and, and discuss that with the client? So I'd say a couple of things. There was a an overall comment that the members of the team must understand, you know, the particular industry and how the client operates in the industry, that they should have experience, you know, enough able to work with. For example, if it, the example was given of an IP case, if it's a technical case, make sure that you have the ability to to for the lawyers to work with the relevant in-house scientists or scientific experts. And that would go to everyone on the team, right? Like not just whoever's running the matter. I would say in my experience, we have one associate um, and I have a couple of counsel in my firm. You know, to me, it goes back to the very same, very first tip of communicate, communicate, communicate. I let folks know, everyone who's on my team, you know, that I think for that particular case, what their role will be. I have not really experienced a lot of pushback, but we're we're lean and mean. So maybe Naomi or even yourself, Dave, uh, have some insights in that regard. Yeah. Naomi, did you have anything on that? Sure. I, ha- I have a couple of things that I can add on that. I mean, one thing that, that I'll say to, to touch on what Nicole was mentioning about diversity, we did get that a, a pet peeve is you know, I, and I've read this many times and heard this on many panels, don't put people in the pitch who are not actually going to work on the case. You know, certainly don't provide a, a diverse pitch team and that just for the sake of diversity, if those people aren't really going to work on the matter. I do work a lot with the associates here in, uh, in our office and across the firm. And one of the things that I think is important is that everyone wants you to staff your cases efficiently. So you have to give some thought to, you know, should we add associates to the team because it will be more cost effective for the client 
And is it truly cost effective? Sometimes handing something off to an associate that is, you know, too difficult for them can end up costing more money in the time that it takes to revise and go back and forth. And so sometimes there are things that perhaps the more senior attorneys need to handle. But that's something that we always need to be mindful of is do we have the right people on the team? You know, do we have, you know, really all types of diversity, diversity of skill level as well, you know, whether it's paralegals or other professionals or associates, um, making sure that you have the the right skill set for the matter. And I'd like to add one little thing to that that actually is going to, I think, ultimately lead to Naomi's final tip. One of the ways that I manage things. I I really believe that everyone on the team should be aware of what's going on in a particular matter and that it's better to have more people, for example, on calls with clients than not if I can. But clients don't want to pay, in my experience, oftentimes don't want to pay for more than one lawyer to, unless the both, you know, the lawyers are both adding value, for example. But there is some pushback, I think, to to charge. And I actually just don't think it's appropriate to charge for absolutely everyone being on that call. It can make for a very expensive call. So oftentimes what I'll do, especially because our our associate's pretty junior, is I'll let the client know I want the attorney on there, the associate on there, partially because I want him fully informed on their matter. But I'm transparent. Also, I want to make sure he's getting trained and I'm not going to charge them for that. And, you know, I just kind of build that into, you know, how I financially structure things in my firm to make that feasible. But I think we need as lawyers to make sure we're doing things right and staffing things appropriately, but, and also keeping in mind our other needs, you know, to train people, to make sure things are running smoothly, even if that means you have to make some adjustments on billing and things like that. You know, I, I'm looking at the overall big picture. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that clients end up valuing as they understand. And, and that shows that you're in a partnership with them too, you know, that you're protecting their interests and making sure that they're getting the right level of service without nickel and diming them for every little thing. That makes a ton of sense. And yeah, d- that does dovetail very well into Naomi, your, your last tip, which I think is on budgeting. It is. That was a common theme that we heard from in-house counsel. Um, I know, you know, budgeting is not everyone's favorite thing to do. It's certainly not mine, but it's something that's really top of mind for in-house counsel. Uh, it's really important to understand their budget requirements and to keep them updated as the case progresses, especially if you're going over budget or something unexpected arises, you know, tell them right away, explain what's going on, give them time to adjust rather than surprising them with with a bill at the end. Certainly, this is very important to maintaining your client relationships after a matter ends you know, even if you get a great result, if you didn't stick to the budget or didn't communicate about it well, they may not want to work with you again because that that's one of the key things they're going to remember about the case is their frustration with the budget. Um, we also got a good tip that when you're providing a budget to in-house counsel, provide a detailed list of assumptions and include them with any proposed budget so they understand what is built into that budget. And then how do you recommend approaching the client if you're about to go over a budget, for example, because exigent circumstances, something happens in the case or you find out, well, we actually need to subpoena and take depositions of, you know, five other people. Um, how, how do you go about having that conversation? Well, sure. I think that this is part of understanding the client expectations. You know, a lot of clients have outside counsel guidelines and look at that to make sure you're complying with what they want. But I think probably the key thing to do first is pick up the phone and say, you know, I know we gave you this budget for the year, the quarter, whatever it is, but we were operating under the assumption that there were only going to be four depositions. And, you know, this thing happened, a new party got added or plaintiff changed their theory, whatever happened in the case. And now there are going to be 10 depositions. So we need to go back and amend the budget. I think now we need to increase this, you know, have that conversation, ask them what they need from you to 
give to the people they report to so that you can figure that out. Because for some clients, that may be a big deal. For other clients, you know, maybe there's a lot of leeway built in or they might say, oh, well, that's fine. I just settled another case. I didn't think that would settle. It'll all balance out. Um, but this is really, a ma- it all goes back to every client is a little bit different. So I think the answer to probably almost all the questions is pick up the phone and tell them and and, um, and talk about the situation. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Well, we're getting down to kind of our last uh, moments together, end of our discussion. Do you guys have any final thoughts for our audience on sort of maintaining relationships within house council? I actually wanted to add a couple of things on the budget part of it, because I think that there's a wide variety of experience level with in-house counsel who may be managing litigation. So you can get the general counsel in a smaller company, you know, maybe they have a few people on their team, haven't had a lot of experience with particularly larger litigations versus, you know, a, a, a very large company that where it's the head of litigation and they do it all the time and they they understand how much things cost and have a frame of reference for it. So one of the things that I've had good experience with is when you get that general counsel who really needs to understand how you're getting to where you're getting and maybe they weren't a litigator even, right? So they don't have the frame of reference. It's oftentimes helpful to walk them through the budget and let them understand and why things are the way they are, you know, because especially if the numbers are big, it it can be sticker shock for them. And then their CEO is going to be looking to them to explain it. The other thing I found helpful with that is to provide some context for GCs or in-house attorneys who don't have that deep litigation experience. So for example, with I do a lot of IP litigation and there are resources out there that are, you know, more or less publicly available that, kind of tell you what the industry standards are for cases of certain types. And I like to provide those along with my budget. So it's like, look, you know, my budget's in line with industry standards for the case like yours. You can also do that within your own firm, right? Like we just handled 10 cases like this last year and this is, you know, right within that. So I think I found that's another thing that's very helpful with budgeting to be able to contextualize it for the in-house attorney because then they can use that and and they love that. They can really use that with their CEO because they're going to get asked those same questions and they don't have those answers. So again, you know, your job is to help them do their jobs. So it it's it can be a very meaningful interaction and set the right tone for the case. Excellent. Naomi, any final thoughts? So I think my my final thought would be you know, I think some of the best client relationships we have is when we get to know them as a person, you know, take those opportunities to get to learn about the people that you're dealing with. Um, it, it all kind of ties into respecting their schedules, you know, understand if people have kids at home, what kind of hours do they like to work? Do you have somebody who you know, they have to be out the door at five o'clock on the dot and they're they're going to be really irritated if you, you send them something later or are they somebody who goes home and, and does more work later in the evening? The more you know about about your your clients and can connect with them on a personal level. And I think part of that is also being real on a, a personal level, too. You know, there are times that sometimes somebody will say, oh, can we have a call at this time? I'll be upfront about, well, actually, I've got to get home because because we have a soccer game. But can we do it at that time? And bring that personal element into the the relationship so that you can connect. And some of this is is harder and easier now with the pandemic. I feel like we've seen more people, more of our in-house counsel on Zoom that maybe you would have only been on the phone before and you've started to see their house and their pets and their families. And maybe you're getting out and doing more client visits now and making those connections. So I think that's one of the things that I really like about going to some, to conferences like corporate counsel is you get to make those in-person human connections with people. Hopefully you see some of your clients at the conference and get to know those things about them it, that deepen the relationship, help you understand where they're coming from, what's important to them, and just helps you overall have a better relationship. And, and I think it's also makes everything more enjoyable when you have an actual friendship with with the people you're working with if possible. Absolutely. And that really helps to maintain those long-term relationships. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Naomi Berry, Nicole Galley, thank you so much for being on the show today. 
pleasure. Thanks for having us, Dave. And now it's time for our quick tip from the ABA litigation section's mental health and wellness task force. And I'd like to welcome Sharla Stevens for her first tip on the podcast. Sharla is a lawyer and business consultant who provides workplace training, independent investigations, strategic human resource consulting, and mediation and conflict resolution services. She previously practiced law in New Hampshire and Massachusetts for more than 37 years and spent the majority of her career at McLean Middleton, a regional law firm with more than 100 lawyers, where she chaired the employment practice group and also represented schools and healthcare practices. So welcome to the show, Charla. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate you having me. Well, I understand you're going to be talking about running and how that has helped your practice. So what's your quick tip for today? Okay. Well, as lawyers, we often talk about ways to alleviate stress and anxiety of our jobs and of course our daily lives. And there's no shortage of articles, books, podcasts, talking about the benefits of exercise, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, sleep, proper nutrition. Um, they're all very helpful, but not one solution works for every person at every point in their lives. Um, throughout my career, and especially during the pandemic, I tried them all, and each worked for a little and for a time. Like any other lawyer, though, I turned most of these into competitive activities. How many virtual classes could I do? How many meditation minutes? How fast? How long? How far? How often? Which only led me to more stress about missing a day or failing at a certain level. So I'm a lifelong runner, having started at the age of 15, sometimes competitive running, sometimes not, and sometimes even taking months or years off. I'm a true middle-of-the-pack runner, far from first and far from last. When I approached my 50th birthday, I decided I would accomplish my goal of running a marathon, so I got myself a book and took to training, mostly alone. Um, it helped me physically, of course, but also mentally in helping to keep me focused, put other things out of my mind for the hour or two or sometimes even longer that I was running or training. Of course, running isn't for everyone, but the two important things which helped me mentally during the pandemic and actually a little bit before and certainly since were built around running and they were community and purpose. Rather than running alone, I joined a running club, which had virtual training sessions and races. I met people I never would have come into contact with, but for running, we built a community around running, which is now carried out of the pandemic. And we travel together, hike, ski, and do other things. And then again, instead of simply running races, I started running races for charity. And I've raised over $100,000 since my first Boston Marathon in 2017 for causes that are important to me. Running in my teens and 20s was about competition, fitness, and fighting for equal opportunity with men because I actually started running pre-Title VII. Running in my 30s and 40s was really about health and fitness. And now in my 60s, it's about community, focus, and purpose. It's given me a sense of belonging and a feeling that I'm contributing, and it's built physical and mental resilience, which is so important in the practice of law. I'm not saying that running will do these things for everyone, but what's important is to find some passion outside of work which will build you and sustain you and will hopefully carry you into your post-practice years and your retirement. Find your purpose, and hopefully your perspective will follow as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for those tips, Charlotte. Thanks so much for being with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. All right. And that's all we have for our show today. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about today's episode. If you have comments or a question you'd like for me to answer in an upcoming show, you can email me at dscrivenyoung without the hyphen at gmail.com and connect with me on social. I'm at attorney DSY on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also connect with the ABA litigation section on those platforms as well. But as much as I'd like to connect with you online, nothing beats meeting in person at one of our next litigation section events. So please make plans to join us at the Corporate Council CLE seminar and or Orlando, Florida, February 16th through the 18th. The seminar brings together in-house and outside counsel to learn, network, and share expertise about the unique challenges they face in representing corporations of all types. It's designed by and for general counsel and their outside law firms. So to find out more and for in registration information, please go to ambar.org slash corporate counsel. 
If you like the show, please help spread the word by sharing a link to this episode with a friend or through a post on social and invite others to join the show and community. If you can leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, it's incredibly helpful. Even a quick rating over at Spotify, it's super helpful as well. And finally, I want to thank some folks who make the show possible. Thanks to Michelle Oberts, who's on staff with the litigation section for her help, as well as our fabulous producer, Rich Rivera. Thank you, Rich, for all of your hard work. Thanks also goes out to my fellow co-chairs of the litigation section's audio contact committee, Josh Jones and Tyler True. Thank you to the audio professionals from Legal Talk Network. And last but not least, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.